Start explaining. Uh, we have the hypothalamus, and we've got a stalk here that's connecting the pituitary gland with the hypothalamus. This is going to be called the infundibulum, and that's just another name for a stalk connecting the two. Uh, as you can see here, I split the pituitary gland into a posterior pituitary and also an anterior pituitary. Those are going to be separated by a line, and this area is going to be called the pars intermedia. Next. We have some different names. So the posterior pituitary is also synonymously called the neurohypothesis, while the anterior pituitary is called the adenohypothesis. Um, a couple parts. So the posterior pituitary, or the neurohypothesis, the area that's going to be down here on the distal end is going to be called the pars nervosa. And that's going to be where a lot of the posterior pituitary hormones are going to be stored. All the posterior pituitary hormones are synthesized in the hypothalamus, but I'll cover that later. Uh, next, the area that's going to be down in here is going to be called the pars distalis. And that's going to be where a lot of the anterior pituitary hormones are going to be synthesized and then released into the bloodstream. So we just covered the anatomy of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And from now on, I just want to make a note that I'm going to refer to the posterior pituitary as the neurohypothesis and the anterior pituitary as the adenohypothesis from here on. That just helps get the diction. Um, it, it keeps the terms to a minimum. So now we're going to go on to the blood supply of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So we're first going to start off with the neurohypothesis, and it is going to get its blood supply from the inferior hypophyseal artery. And that artery is going to come in, and it's going to collect all the pre-made hormones from the post, uh, neurohypothesis and then send it into the hypophyseal vein. From the vein, it's going to go to the body. Uh, the adenohypophysis is going to get its blood supply from the superior hypophyseal artery, but first, it's going to travel to the hypothalamus. From there, the hypothalamus will release its hormones into the portal vein, into a capillary network, and the uh, adenohypophysis will release its hormones and then send those also to the hypophyseal vein, which will go to the body again. One important note is the portal vein. As you can tell, it's between two arteries uh, or a capillary network. The portal vein is one of two main portal systems in the body, one in the liver and then one in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Another note to make is the uh, trabecular artery is going to be connecting the superior and the inferior hypophyseal artery. I didn't draw that in simply because I drew each artery coming in on different sides, but typically they'd be running together and there would be an artery called the trabecular artery that connects the two. So let's take a deeper look at the, the uh, hormones produced by the neurohypothesis. So the hormones of the neurohypothesis are actually not made within the neurohypothesis. You have two hormones and one is going to be antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, and oxytocin. These two hormones will be actually made in the hypothalamus, and what they're going to be doing is once they're synthesized, they'll travel to the neurohypothesis via neurons. Neurons within these systems have swellings called herring bodies. These swellings are actually going to store the synthesized hormone until release. So again, these two hormones will be made in the hypothalamus, travel down to the uh, neurohypothesis, so the pituitary gland. And when stimulated, it will secrete the hormones that are being stored in the herring bodies. So let's take a look at these two hormones. First hormone we're going to take a look at is a, uh, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. So a stimuli will uh, trigger the hypothalamus to make the antidiuretic hormone. Then the antidiuretic hormone will travel down into the herring bodies and wait for release. Upon release, it will go into the blood vessels, causing constriction, and the kidneys causing water resorption. The other hormone, oxytocin, happens in a similar manner. Upon release, it will cause milk letdown and uterine contractions, typically associated with pregnancy. So we just talked about the hormones of the neurohypothesis. So now let's take a look at the hormones of the adenohypothesis. This whole screen is a little busy, so I'm going to try and break it down and just kind of simplify things. First, we're going to start with our picture of the anatomy. We have the hypothalamus, which is going to have five hormones that affect the adenohypothesis. They're going to travel down through the portal vein, 
and then down in the adenal hypothesis, you're going to have five different cell types. You're going to have the thyrotropes, corticotropes, mammotropes, somatotropes, and gonadotropes. Each of those is going to secrete a different hormone. Um, that being luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating, stimulating hormone, LHFSH, growth hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and thyroid stimulating hormone. These five hormones will be released down into the system uh, based on the influence of the hypothalamic uh, hormones. So, taking a look over here, you're going to have gonadotropin releasing hormone which positively stimula stimulates those gonadotropes, which release the LHFSH, which then goes on to the target organ. Another one, you're going to have growth hormone releasing hormone, which is going to travel down through the portal vein, act on those somatotropes, and secrete growth hormone down into the system. Somatostatin is going to inhibit the release of that growth hormone down into the body. Uh, so if you have somatostatin acting upon those somatotropes, that's going to be inhibitory. The next one, PIH, is going to stand for prolactin inhibiting hormone, and that's going to be an analog of dopamine. So if you have any drugs that are dopaminergic agonists, that is going to um, be the same as a prolactin inhibiting hormone. So again, that's going to come down, and that's going to actually inhibit the mammotropes from releasing their prolactin. So if you have a lot of PIH, it's going to inhibit the prolactin release. Um, another one, you got the corticotropin releasing hormone, which is going to positively stimulate. ACTH is going to be released from the um, corticotropes down in the adenal hypothesis. That's going to go to the adrenal cortex. And then finally, you got thyrotropin releasing hormone. Again, it's going to positively stimulate those thyrotropes, which releases its TSH down into the bloodstream, goes to the thyroid gland. Um, I did make a note here. The start. Two cell types, so somatotropes and mammotropes, are both acidophils, meaning they like to stain um, pink. Then you got the basophils, which are going to be the rest, staining more of a blue. Um, one note that I would like to make is it's a clinical correlation. So let's say you're a biker or a motorcyclist, and you uh, get in a crash, fall off, and hit your head against the cement. That can uh, cause trauma to the brain, and that could also shear your infundibulum, also known as your stock. So you're you're separating your hypothalamus from your pituitary gland. What that's going to do is it's going to prevent all these releasing hormones from affecting the uh, different cell types. So for in this case, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone cannot stimulate those gonadotropes, so you're going to have a drop in the LHFSH. Likewise, you're going to drop your growth hormone, you're going to drop your ACTH, and you're going to drop your TSH. The only exception is going to be the PIH, so the prolactin. Since this is inhibitory, when you inhibit your inhibition, it's like a double negative, and your prolactin is actually going to increase. So you're going to positively stimulate that prolactin. So if you shear this infundibulum, you're going to have an excess prolactin release with all your other four hormones uh, being inhibited. 